One of the biggest mysteries in biology centers, perhaps surprisingly, around one of its smallest organisms, single-celled ocean-dwelling plankton. Specifically, why are there so many different species? Welcome to Minute Earth. In most instances, when similar species live in the exact same place and compete for the exact same resources, only one species succeeds, and the other ones either go extinct or have to try something different. In California, for example, when almost identical plants known as tar weeds and rosin weeds start growing on the same rocky hillside, the rosin weeds will take over and the tar weeds will die off. And in the American Northeast, different bird species that once competed for the same resources in the same spruce trees now don't. The Cape May warbler has come to dominate the valuable top of the tree, while other warbler species have had to carve out a different living lower in the tree. In these situations, a tiny little difference, like rosin weeds' marginally quicker growth in shallow soil, gives them a slight advantage again and again and again. It's enough to result in one species coming out on top. These KOs are backed up by math. We've figured out equations that simulate how matchups between similar species will play out. And in almost every case, the models agree that there's going to be a winner, and that winner will take all. Over time, one species will apply its small advantage again and again and again, and become the champion. Plankton seem like they should follow this winner-take-all rule too. After all, most plankton species compete for the same resources within the same surface layer of the ocean. One species should come to dominate, and the other should scram, right? But instead, thousands of very similar plankton species all seem to coexist in relative harmony. What gives? One possibility is that the models are wrong, at least for plankton, because they don't account for the unpredictable conditions in which plankton live. Wind and waves may be mixing up the water enough, and regularly enough, that no one plankton species has enough time to exploit whatever tiny advantage they have and outcompete their rivals. Perhaps every disturbance simply puts all the competitors back on nearly equal footing, just like when tar weeds and rosin weeds first start growing on that rocky hillside. The second possibility is that the models are right, but we're using them wrong. When scientists collect plankton from the ocean, they often use what's called a plankton net, basically a stocking attached to a bottle. When they pull this contraption through the water, they may actually be sampling several different micrometer-thick microenvironments, each with a slightly different combination of resources. So while it appears that several species of plankton are coexisting peacefully, perhaps what we're actually seeing is a jumbled up collection of species that, in their natural state, actually dominate their own tiny, just different enough microenvironments. It's as if we counted all the birds in the spruce tree together and said, these trees are shared by many similar species of warblers, without realizing that they specialize in different parts of the tree. Recently though, many researchers have come to favor a third possibility. The model is right, but occasionally spits out something weird. It turns out that when you model five or more species competing for three or more resources, the entire system can occasionally get caught in a chaotic loop and no clear winner ever emerges. It seems like this is the case for certain groups of cave-dwelling bats. Maybe the coexistence of thousands of species of plankton is the result of that chaos too. One thing is for sure, as much as we know about the world, to truly understand its inhabitants, even those as seemingly simple as single-celled sea dwellers, we've got a plankton more to learn.